Why don't we get started with our next presentation? Brianna Ingerman is going to be speaking to us on a, a really interesting topic, the idea of taking astronomy, um, uh, social, emotional learning, and you know how to bring science, uh, teaching standards, and uh, the conversation between students and educators all together. So take it away, Brianna. Great, thanks so much. And I'm really glad to be here with y'all today. Um, so yeah, uh, just as Benjamin was saying, I wanted to highlight a new set of programs that we've been developing at this planetarium that approaches astronomy learning in a bit of a different way uh, by infusing planetarium programs with social and emotional learning. And um, obviously for something like this, I'd like to start with a jar of Skittles. Um, so put on your fourth grade hats, please. Imagine you're in fourth grade and I want us to think about this jar of Skittles. I want you to, to in your head, take a guess. How many Skittles do you think are in this jar and why? What's your evidence for it? And I'm not gonna give you as much time as I would give some students. Because now I want you, we're gonna think about this kind of hypothetically. I want you to imagine now being paired with a partner. So you and a partner are put together to talk about how many skills you think are in this jar and why. And you must choose only one of your two answers. You cannot compromise. You have to choose yours or your partner's. And now I want you to imagine you and your partner get paired up with another pair of two people. So you have a group of four. Each of your pairs is coming with one answer. And you have to repeat this. Pick one of the two answers and um, maintain the evidence, right? Like why, why are we going with that answer? And now you do that one more time. So you're in a large group of eight. You have to come up with the ultimate answer for how many Skittles there are and why. And all along the way, almost all of you had to let go of your answer in favor of someone else's answer. There will only be a few of you that were able to stick with your answer the whole way through. So as a fourth grader, what do you think it would feel like to have to let go of your answer? You can go ahead and type in the, the chat on River if you want to. Would letting go of your answer be easy or hard? What would it feel like to have to accept someone else's guess? Disappointing, Sarah says. A fourth grader, for a fourth grader, it might be hard, Michelle says. Makes me sad, says Michael. All right, I'll let people keep typing. Perhaps it depends on how confident you felt in your answer, right? If you were really confident, it'd be really hard to let go of your answer. If <laughs> skitty, skittle semifinals, <laughs> um, if maybe you just kind of took a random guess, maybe it wouldn't be too hard to switch to someone else's answer. In the field of science, we frequently have to let go of guesses. We do this all the time, right? That's just the nature of science. People are more often wrong than they are right. And as a very clear example, uh, we can take a look at the great debate from the year 1920, when astronomers Heber Curtis and Harlow Shapley debated publicly about the nature of spiral nebulae and the size of the universe. For researchers who have spent years devoting their life to studying one hypothesis, only for it to be proven wrong and to have to let go of their answer, how do you imagine that to feel? Right? Maybe you can even really, in your personal life, think back to a time when you had to make a di difficult decision and let go of your answer. This very human element of the process of science is rarely explicitly mentioned, let alone supported in science education. But it's a deeply embedded part of learning and successfully navigating in the scientific community or even just as a person in your everyday life. For how prevalent this human element is, we still often teach astronomy as an objective set of facts. So our goal last year was to explore this connection between science and the human experience more deeply.
Um, in the world of education and human development, there's a name for the human experience side of things. It's called social emotional learning or SEL. SEL is the process through which people gain knowledge, skills um, to do things like develop healthy identities, manage their emotions, um, achieve personal goals or work collaboratively with others. So research strongly shows that social and emotional competencies can be taught, they can be modeled and they can be practiced and that doing so leads to positive student outcomes. That's really important for success in school and in everyday life. Um, SEL is becoming a stronger focus in K-12 schools, particularly at the elementary level, but students benefit most when it's incorporated kind of throughout their learning, both in school and outside of school. So one of the largest authorities in the field of social and emotional learning is the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, or CASEL. So on the right here is CASEL's SEL framework. In the center, you can see there are five main domains or competencies of um, social and emotional learning. So individuals develop knowledge and skills and attitudes across these five domains and in multiple key settings. So the classroom, schools and families and communities and um, doing so really advances student learning and development. So if you go to CASEL's website, I've um, listed the direct link at the bottom left of this slide, you can find an interactive version of this wheel, which uh, gives you more specific examples of things in each of this, these domains. So for example, in the Skittles activity that we thought about, um, I have, right, um, pulling out some of those specific examples of where these fit in the domains, having a growth mindset, right? That's really important for science learning how to make reasoned judgment after analyzing information, data, and facts, or um, working together to resolve conflicts constructively uh, to get to the Skittles semifinals. So we developed some programs, and in the development of these programs, we were interested in applying not only the CASEL SEL competencies, but also the Next Generation Science Standards, and as well as getting direct feedback from teachers, uh, through feedback forms and focus groups. And what resulted was a set of four holistic planetarium programs that try to approach science in kind of a, um, I guess, a more holistic way. Uh, so these programs are built to be about 60 minutes long and incorporate a high amount of interactivity with students. Uh, we have lots of small group and large group discussions. We ask students to respond in the chat, just like I asked you to respond in the chat. Um, we even ask them to do kind of like using their videos on a thumb scale. So, uh, for example, how well did your team do at working together to solve this problem? Give us like you did your team did really well or not so great. And then that gives you a visual. You can actually call on those students and ask if they're willing to share why what could have gone better. How could they have worked better together? 60 minutes for a program is a really short amount of time to make a difference. Um, so we also provided teachers with some recommended pre and post visit activities and resources they can do with their students before and after they visit with us. Um, so these include some activities and discussion questions focused both on the science content and on the social and emotional learning content. Um, and then we were able to translate some of these supporting materials into Spanish. We're still working on doing that more fully. Our central audience for these programs are fourth through ninth graders. Uh, this is kind of the range in which NGSS specifies the most number of kind of earth and space science standards. And it's also the prime age for kids to be developing those social and emotional skills. Because uh, these were built during the era of COVID, we constructed these as virtual shows, um, sharing some of the time a fisheye view of our dome. Sometimes it would just be breakout rooms or discussions. And then we had three or more educators who took on different roles and led some of those breakout room discussions. This summer though, because we returned uh, to some in-person programming, we were able to adapt one of these programs for in-person and we plan on continuing to run these programs both in-person and online. So the first program that we developed and you saw kind of just a little glimpse into it, with the Skittles activity is the galaxies that grew our minds. 
program. And the focus here, at least on the science content, is really just that the universe is much larger than we originally thought it was. By um, and We have evidence for this by looking at other galaxies. Um, but really focused on how being wrong is a part of science and it provides a way for us to keep learning collaboratively. Our second program is called Changing Climates, A Tale of Three Planets, which um, students, yeah, they learn about the uh, climate change in from the perspective of astronomy, where we learned about the Earth by studying Venus and Mars. Um, but as kids learn about climate change, it's also well studied that kids can get feelings of being really overwhelmed um, and kind of shut down. So how can we tackle kind of large and overwhelming problems? Well, we can um, break them down into smaller pieces that are more digestible and that you can actually play a role in directly. Um, this one also had a take home, um, take home discussion question where kids get to talk to their parents or, or um, adult guardians about the change that they've seen in their life uh, in terms of weather patterns over time. So it's really trying to bring that SEL into the, the community and the home space in addition to just this informal education space. Our third program called Overcoming the Challenges of Traveling to Mars focused on how in the future, right, when we send people to Mars, there are going to be all these huge challenges that we have to overcome, both mental and physical challenges, harsh environments, isolated spaces. So how can we collaborate effectively with a team and manage mental health um, in a productive way? And this uh, mirrored well with what was going on with COVID, right? Lots of kids were feeling isolated at home. So this was a way to kind of talk about some of those mechanisms to, to overcome feelings of isolation. And our fourth in the series was meteor shower stories, uh, where we look at how meteor showers are caused by the leftover comet dust um, and can be seen, seen annually. Um, but of course, there are stories throughout ages about the night sky and about meteors. And so how can we hold value in both cultural stories and in scientific understanding together rather than um, at odds with each other? So uh, we ended up running these programs over the past year with um, over 12,000 students across Colorado. Many of these were with uh, uh, schools that were urban uh, area, Title I, so free and reduced lunch in the kind of Denver metro area. 14 of these were from more rural districts around Colorado. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's these teal, teal pins on the, on the map here. And um, like maybe many of you, we normally might not have thought about developing online programs that could be useful to rural populations or even to urban populations that can't afford to get to where we are. So the silver lining from COVID here was that we were able to, able to develop a robust set of programs that can be run virtually with schools, um, but would normally be out of our reach. I mentioned that we did some surveys with teachers. So we um, asked them to respond to the survey and then had many different questions. Received a lot of great feedback. Um, of those who responded, three quarters were very satisfied with the program. And uh, we found that the teachers felt like the balance between science content and social and emotional learning content was about right. Uh, we also received some feedback that helped us make some small adaptations to our programs over time. So for instance, we found that about three quarters of the teachers found the pre and post visit resources useful, uh, but a reasonable fraction of them either didn't use them or found them not super helpful. So we ended up shifting and now we send out the pre and post visit resources kind of like all at once ahead of time so that the teachers have more time to uh, either take a look at what's in there or to kind of digest how it might fit into their, their curriculum. Um, great. So here are some teacher testimonials. Um, like I said, we had a lot of positive feedback. Uh, and things like the students were talking nonstop afterward, you know, students kept asking questions. But perhaps the most rewarding feedback that we got was when teachers indicated that they felt like these programs served as a valuable example for how they could bring in SEL into their classrooms more regularly. 
research shows that students usually benefit when SEL is incorporated throughout their learning experiences, kind of as I mentioned before. And so this was really promising to be able to kind of serve as that example for how to integrate SEL into science teaching. We're currently in the process of refining our scripts for each show, our materials that we send out and other supporting resources like a list of tips for how to effectively incorporate social and emotional learning. And we plan to release the full educator guides to our programs for free later this fall um, with the hope that at least maybe they can inspire some additional ideas for how to approach informal science learning in a more holistic way. So if you're interested in being notified when these programs become available, you can sign up on this list and we will reach back out to you later this year. Thanks so much. I'll take any questions. Yeah, there was one that came in a little earlier, Brianna, from Mike yeah. Marie. How are the schools made aware of the program and how did they sign up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we um, have been slowly developing some partnerships with surrounding districts. Um, both urban and uh, some rural districts. And so we ended up, um, we have some points of contact who are either like uh, science teacher leads. So they oversee the science program for ele their elementary schools, for instance, at that district. We also had some contacts. We, we did some searching a while back um, for any social and emotional learning specialists. And we touched base with some of them to also let them know about this opportunity. And then they passed it on to their teachers that they work with. Um, so that worked pretty well. And then, yeah, yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. This is John Bell over in Fort Pierce, Florida. I was, took a lot of the science, how science works classes from my master's. Uh, we pulled out Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Thomas Kuhn, I think, wrote it. I'm not sure. But the idea was that when an idea went out of favor, it was because a, a more elegant, more beautiful theory came in to take the place of it, even if there were no evidences for it. So that you saw Copernicus and Galileo and so on pushing the heliocentric theory, even though there had been no proof of the Earth's motion around the sun until 1838 in Bessel, I think. Um, but it was just an idea. I think the summation of it was, it's an idea whose thing has come. And then I went to a few conferences and one of my instructors in paleo said, no, this is not how you come up with a new paradigm. The way you do it is you're young and you have an idea and the old school doesn't like it at all but some of your young colleagues, uh, contemporaries do like it. And eventually the old fossils either die or retire. And then suddenly your uh, theory is at the top of the heap. And it's just kind of an interesting interplay between how new paradigms are set in place and new theories are brought forth and basically the, the human condition. Mm -hmm. Did you guide anything like that from any of the experiences you've had question did i sorry can you repeat the question again did you get any uh uh did you get any experiences like that in, in as you went along with uh, mm. any directions like that um right and you're talking about kind of almost like in this particular case the paradigm shift almost being leveraging social and emotional learning in yes, the education yes, space yeah yeah, yeah. Very, very much social yeah Right, yeah. Um, you know what, we haven't really, we've had a lot of strong interest from everybody that we've talked to. Um, of course, maybe that was self-selecting, uh, right? These were teachers who we advertised to and then they reached out back to us and said, yes, we're very interested mm -hmm. in this. Um, however, we had, we definitely had some, so, so no, I guess my short answer is no, we didn't really encounter that. Um, and I was a little bit surprised by that just mm -hmm. because this is a yeah, different, different mm -hmm. model here. Um, but because it's becoming a, a, I guess it's becoming more of a buzzword in the education space. And so I think a lot of teachers are starting to recognize the value in that. Um, but we do, we were, okay. So I guess we were aware that um, by talking to our social and emotional learning experts at various schools that elementary teachers are 
are pretty much on board with, with this type of concept. But that once you start getting up to say high school, um, then it becomes a lot more iffy. There's a lot of science teachers that are like, this has nothing to do with me. I don't understand why, you know, why this is important. And so um, our social and emotional learning experts recommended that this is where it could be valuable to have these programs to demonstrate, here's how we can integrate the social and emotional learning with even high level science concepts. So um, yeah, there's definitely pushback from some teachers, but we didn't experience it directly. What you're saying makes a lot of sense because in the secondary schools, you're going to find students shifting over from pre-operational or concrete operational uh, methods of thinking as uh, Piaget would say to what they call formal operations. And of course, everything gets a lot more complicated and a lot more intricate. So, and you're also gonna find uh, science teachers who've had more science classes than elementary teachers. Mm -hmm. And, and I would expect you'd find more pushback there. It'd be nice to mm -hmm. find a way to kind of measure all of that. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's generally just more discomfort with once you become more of an expert in a particular field, right? You've also not, you've not really spent a lot of time learning about how to manage a classroom of high schoolers in a social and emotional learning space, right? That's not a skill set that you can develop, so it's hard to. I don't know. I, I learned that. It pretty fast. <laughs> oh sure, no, and I'm sorry. I'm not. That was a blanket statement, and that I shouldn't have made. But um, <laughs> right, that's why some there's some pushback too. It's just like, no, I want to just teach my content. You know, well, it's, it's a lot of sink or swim. You know, is after like a month or so, and you say, you know, I I'm not sure this is for me. My son is teaching. Oh, heaven help us. He's teaching fifth graders starting next week for the first time, and he's he's like a business literature major. I I don't know where this is going, but I'm I'm looking forward to to his experiences too. Definitely. Thanks for your question. Thank you for answering. So you've got a question here on the river, um, Andy Krejci. You want to know I, at the bottom of your screen? It says the work was funded by the uh, University of Colorado Office of Outreach and Engagement. And I guess he was in curious as to um, that background of that funding source. Yeah, you bet. Um, so yeah, Fisk Planetarium is located on the University of Colorado. And um, thankfully the University of Colorado also has this office of outreach and engagement that tends to fund um, lots of different outreach projects every year um, on multiple different kind of funding levels uh, all the way down from something very small, a couple of thousand dollars um, up to say a cross departmental um, project up to say $24,000. And, um, you know, yeah, I think we're very thankful to, to have this type of office on our campus. Uh, they only fund programs that are associated with the university. Um, but I would be, I would encourage you if you are part of a university to, to see if your university has some sort of outreach office and, um, and explore if there are any, at least small funding uh, pots there. Hopefully that answered that question. If I didn't fully answer it, let me know. Okay, any other questions? So I put the uh, tiny URL into the uh, river chat so you can click on through and fill out the form on the page. I already have. And uh, interested in, of course, all the future stuff you come up with. Sounds really good. Yeah. Thanks for putting oh. those links. Um, can I just answer this one last question? Sure, of course, of course. Great. Um, all right, Satoshi says, when presenting these programs, what was the typical audience size? Uh, we very intentionally <laughs> learned quickly that our audience size should be less than 40 students at a time. Um, and almost the 20 student range is the most ideal. Uh, really you're wanting a high educator to student ratio, which sometimes can be really challenging, but with a high student to uh, high educator to student ratio, you can get into like deeper conversations with students and students, even within the span of 60 minutes, will start to develop a little bit more of a like trust with you. So they'll be willing to share a little bit more deeply. Um, 
So that's why I mentioned we had for these programs usually three, sometimes even more educators. Uh, there, were, there were a couple of times where we ran 60 person groups and we found that that was a little bit too much, but then we ended up having like four or five educators to kind of assist in different breakout rooms. So you can, you can experiment with that, but we definitely found that the, uh, the higher number of educators was really useful or smaller group sizes of students. Thanks so much. Awesome. Awesome. You know, this doesn't really, uh, I think this is a little bit off the wall, but when I hear the, when I heard the phrase social emotional learning, what I think of is kids uh, acting out, you know, how, how do you control kids? Um, or how do you make kids behave like human beings in a classroom, uh, in kids who are acting out? And uh, I, I think that's a, a total, maybe, is that a totally different topic or is that really? No, it's actually, yeah, thanks for that question. It's actually very related in some ways. Um, and that's where some of these social and emotional skills, some of them are more applicable to the science teaching space than others, right? So the, the management of uh, kids' emotions may be a little bit more distant, but there were still times where uh, we would have kids working collaboratively in a team or they were supposed to be, and then one person would just talk over every other student. And then we would have a discussion about it afterwards, of like how what's important about working in a team, you know? And then the kid, we have the kids name things like, oh, it's helpful to be able to hear everyone, or it's helpful not to shout because then it makes people feel sad if you're shouting at them. And so there are, there are surprise, or at least for me, coming from a science background, not a social emotional learning background, working with our consultant um, who is a social and emotional learning expert, it was fascinating to learn and have my eyes open to all of these different ways you can actually insert little little tidbits throughout to kind of manage students in a way that uh, makes them feel valued, but also gets to a result that's, that's productive. So, thanks. From Mike Murray, how, how are the schools made aware of this program and how did they sign up? Mike wanted to know. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I might've mentioned briefly that the, uh, we had some contacts within various districts um, who were both in the uh, science teacher leader uh, space and the social and emotional learning expert space. And we let them know about these programs and then they pass that along to schools who they thought might be interested and teachers who they might thought, uh, thought might be interested. And that worked really well. And so now we have these ongoing partnerships with more school districts as a result. 